Welcome to the Parasite Podcast, a show about me and you. We are Venom. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Parasite Podcast. And today I am very excited for the guests that we have because out of all the comments I get on the channel, uh, I, I rarely get someone who disagrees with me or will challenge me or will gr agree with me on half of what I say, but then also like give their perspective. I usually just see a lot of like complimentary comments, and although I love those, I do like someone out there who doesn't see everything eye to eye with me. And there is no better representation of that in the in the comment section of my videos than the person we're talking to today. So swordsmen, say hello to everyone and let them know. I guess you're pretty much exclusively just on comments on, on YouTube, aren't you? Yeah. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here. Hey, no problem, man. I'm, gl I'm glad you're here. And, uh, and you know, today we're just going to have a fun conversation, you know, just like we do on all the other episodes of this. And luckily, you're the first person that I'm recording post the episodes actually going up so you kind of already know the vibe of the show and I gotta ask you know have you been you know enjoying this as an addition to the channel so far yes I have I've been really interested in hearing every you know person you brought up so far and they all have interesting you know takes on how they met Venom you know how they were introduced and what their thoughts on and then you uh, are able to you know go sidetrack to a different conversation like teenage teenage mutant ninja turtles <laughs> which is something that i also liked so it's been nice to actually hear everyone's opinions hey that's awesome and that's what we're here to do today is get your opinion so let's start with that i love that you're a ninja turtle fan so maybe we'll talk a little bit about that today too but let's start with kind of your origin story in the world of uh you know fiction and comic books like what kind of age were you, or what age were you when you started to get into this stuff, and who were some of those early characters that kind of pulled you in? My earliest memories, uh, my family was poor, mm -hmm. so it was kind of a difficulty to actually get, you know, the individual comics, but my earliest memory of Venom is, I think it's either, I met Venom on the Maximum Carnage Super NES game, Cool. Because back then I was into Spider Man. Right. Or the 90s show, but near the end where they actually had the Carnage episodes. Okay. And unfortunately, that gave me a kind of work perspective for, long, for the sh short time because I thought Venom was always, you know, an anti hero. But uh, slowly, very slowly on the rare times we would get to go to the city, I would look at Barnes & Noble, try to find anything Venom, which unfortunately was really hard at the time because he didn't actually have a book. You know, he, right. it was different miniseries. Right. And that's actually how I ended up getting into Sonic the Hedgehog comics because they were just easier to find. But my greatest prized possession from the time is I got the red holographic cover of Venom Lethal Protector one, number one. Ooh. Oh, nice. And I slowly was able to get the pieces, of, you know, the rest of the pieces of the story, which was helped by, uh, there was this one action figure line that had a comic book in the back. Okay. And there was one where Venom was fighting one of the jury for the figure and on the back was the actually the last piece of lethal protector that was missing sweet is that the cover where there's like a jury's head on the ground with venom stepping yeah over? i think so yeah cool that's a great one um so that's sweet so you so early on like you said and and i can understand i remember around the time Venom was a thing. The reason I didn't know about him at first, much like you, is because my parents just went through a divorce and we left with my mom and we, we had no money. And we were actually staying in all three of us sleeping on the floor of a guest bedroom of like one of my aunt's houses. Um, and uh, and I missed you know a couple years worth of stuff there. And I was also not allowed to read Spider-Man um, for a while. Uh, so I got I too came back in with Maximum Carnage, although I read the comic first and then played the video game. But I, I completely understand what you're what you you mean by that and how how tough it is when you live outside of a city to get access to those things and you know for me if it wasn't for the grocery store I don't think I would have read a lot of comics as a kid 
Were you kind of in a similar boat sometimes? Yeah. Thankfully, the Maximum Carnage game actually tended to be very faithful, surprisingly, for LGN. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, that, it, it is, actually. And it was, you know, touted as the first time you get to play as Venom, which uh, was really exciting for those hardcore Venom fans out there. So, yeah, it's still one of my favorite games to this day. Uh, my first... I, my first comic was either the Lethal Protector that I mentioned earlier, uh-huh. or uh, my, I had the chicken pox one time, and my parents literally searched uh, trying to make me feel better for a Venom comic, and they found that Tooth and Claw issue that I mentioned huh. in the comics. So wow. I have a soft spot for Tooth and Claw. That makes a lot of sense because yeah, I remember when I put my review up of that. Like you know, I I didn't hate the book by any means, but I it definitely was a really goofy story to me, but. You're, you know, I think sometimes people, and I'm glad you mentioned that too, because I think sometimes people get weird about mentioning the comics they first read or why they have a special connection to it as a kid, because they, I don't know, there's sometimes people get embarrassed, I've noticed, and I'm like, oh, don't be. Like, we all, we all love the stuff we loved when we were kids for very different reasons, and it's okay for whatever reason. Like, well, you said chicken pox. I had, when I had chicken pox, Optimus Prime was killed in a movie uh, in the cartoon in the 80s, and uh, and it, that broke my heart. I'm watching it on the couch, crying my, my eyes out, and my, my mom's Sorry. trying, you know, my mom's trying to calm horrible. me. Yeah, she's like, she's trying to calm me down. She's like, oh, I, I, re- I got this movie for you because I thought it would cheer you up, and here, here you're crying because and, and, you have chicken pox, and and so she immediately like ran out to try to buy me a toy just to to calm me down and like no Optimus is still alive here's a toy, um, so so I know what you mean and I know what you mean about that stuff so it's it's great that you have those connections and it it's great that you you did you 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 know defended Tooth and Claw and you're like hey this was something that meant something to me and that's my favorite thing to see in the comments like I, I love hearing people um, you know tell me those kind of stories and so you know with with those mini series and those stuff in the in the 90s that you collected and. Do any of them, when you think about them, do they they connect you to your parents in any way? Do, do they bring back other good memories uh, of your life? Uh, specifically the storylines, Lethal Protector, uh-huh. Maximum Carnage, and Tooth and Claw. Okay. Now that I'm older, I was actually able to track down all the trade paperbacks. And I spent a lot of money just, you know, collecting <laughs> everything. But sure. I, right now I have a full collection of Eddie's, you know, a ri- basically all of Eddie's original appearances, including when he was like a villain. Right. Up to Flash before he left for the Guardians of the Galaxy. Though I do have Space Knight. Okay. All right. So you got, wow, you got a great collection there. And, you know, earlier you said something about, you know, you said you kind of, when you got into Venom, it warped your perception because you, you immediately saw the anti the anti-hero side and not the, um, you know, not the villainous side and stuff. So, now that, because we've, you and I, of course, we probably know where each other stand on Venom stuff because I read your comments, but for those who don't, you know, what is kind of your ideal Eddie Brock or Venom? You know, now that you've said you had that great collection, you've read all those books, you know, now that you're older and you look back at him, what what are the kind of defining traits of Venom for you? For me, the one, like, core defining trait with Eddie and why I'm kind of get aggravated with Venom continuously being, you know, only shown as a villain mm-hmm. is redemption. Right. Because um, you, unlike with most comic book characters, they uh, the status quo usually comes back over and over again. Right. But with Eddie, he actually changed for the better and stayed that way. Sure, the symbiote faltered because of different hosts, but Eddie, you know, kept on that track and actually became and that's why I like Eddie better than Flash because why the Flash is similar because he was a bully he always liked Spider-Man right you know when he was growing up so Eddie really had to change over a long period of time and that's what kind of draws me to the character because uh, you look at his past and he he had abusive dad uh, his only positive person in his life was Anne before she ditched him because of a botched story. Right. And then there was God. Right. Like, and it's kind of a miracle that the symbiote, you know, picked a church when he went in, 
wanted to go and commit suicide. Yeah, it's it's true. It's um, it's funny how fate works, and especially in comic books, and and how there's this obviously there's this bigger plan in a lot of ways in our world, but seeing it translated into a comic book, where it's like okay, we have this really religious guy who's fallen out of you know the the kindness of others, and he kind of feels abandoned, and he's alone, and he's he's at his lowest, and we're gonna send something to help ascend him to a new role in his life. But we're going to send essentially like a you know demon from space in so, in some regards, and it's it's yeah. it's kind of especially neat. with Donnie stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so exactly. Um, but it, it's great that you mention that because we you know me and um, like Eddie's mullet talk about that a lot. Like one aspect of Venom that we really like is the faith acts aspect of Venom and Eddie, uh, because we don't see that in a lot of characters. I would say one of the only other characters in Marvel that kind of ha- touches on that a little bit is. Um, uh, Peter Parker sometimes has spiritual stories, but I wouldn't say they're directly connected to God, minus the one issue where he did actually meet God. But um, but yeah. but Daredevil, obviously, Daredevil has a, yeah. he's very rooted in in Catholicism, and I and I love that about the character, which is why I like when him and Eddie meet. But they always meet under lawyer terms. I would love for them to meet in a church one day <laughs> and just kind of like so, uh, <laughs> yeah, go to confession it's together. Also, actual crossover, you know, yeah. that I've been wanting to see for a while. And if he could somehow get Nightcrawler in, even though he's soulless, Ooh. and I guess he isn't a Christian anymore. Sure. Well, the the new Nightcrawler's from like another dimension or some craziness like that. Um, but you're right. Uh, Nightcrawler being being the priest that would have been a great that would have been a great crossover there. Um, yeah, I like that stuff, and I, I like that you're into that. And, and like I said, everyone has their different takes on Venom, and I I do like that passion you have where you and what you said is so true. Like. Every character is on a hamster wheel in comics. They have to eventually go back to the start. It, it always happens. Every time a new writer comes in, they're like, let's get back to the roots of this character. Let's get back. Venom is the is one of the few characters that actually has evolved. And anytime someone tries to bring him back to his roots, they still bring him back to really the middle of his story, which is the anti-hero side. No one really ever brings him back to the villain side, unless they're translating them in a, into a movie like Spider-Man 3 or a cartoon. You know, other than that, though, for the comic books, his hamster wheel changed. And you're so right about that. You know, I never thought of that. What What was the moment that made you realize that about the character? Like, when? Because that's a great revelation in my mind. I didn't even think about that. It would be the storyline because I collected... Once I've, you know, collected all the old stories and trade paperback, though I didn't go back and get all my costas run. Okay. I went with single issues. Right. And the storyline, I think I discussed this a little bit in the comic section before, is The Last Temptation of Eddie Brock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a and great story. The, the thing, and you see that I actually think anti-Venom period even though he's not quite as full hero as Venom is now, the anti-Venom period, I think, is where Eddie was at his best. Because while there was that one storyline with the Punisher, right. that where he showed him the old me, right. every other storyline featuring anti-Venom, he's completely changed. He doesn't kill criminals. He is actually very faithful, and even though people see it as holier than thou, he likes giving credit to God instead of him, so he's kind of humble in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and he even, he even uh, at the end of his run as Anti Venom, even does a very self-sacrificing, uh, you know, very biblical thing where he 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 gives up his Anti Venomness to save all of New York City, um, a city that hated him. Like, which was, I mean, yeah, yeah it's it's so amazing. It's. It's uh, you're right, and that does put him on that path. And and you're right, anti. I agree with you. Anti Venom Eddie is some of my favorite Eddie stuff, uh, and that and that is the the push forward. And and now looking back at it, hearing your words, like you're right. That's that's the moment where he no longer became trapped in his former hamster wheel. He got on a completely different one. And uh, and may, maybe it's not even a hamster wheel anymore because the way. Donnie's going with them, and the way Costa went with them, it's like there's some repetition there, like with other symbiotes and offsprings and and things like that. But there, it does seem to be going in a in just a different direction, and that is hard to do with any character in comics. And somehow Eddie 
is just like fight, fighting through all the tropes. He's like, no, I, I want to be a character, and you guys are going to make me one, <laughs> one way or the other, and that's that's amazing. It's not only that; he also has to fight through multimedia because the only uh, media that will sometimes even you know acknowledge that his character broke is the video games. Right. Yeah, that's true, and uh, and of course, you know, I know people get upset with like you know. Not not because it's a new interpretation, but sometimes they they're just not a fan of the interpretation. So when like lately, let's talk about like just stuff that's happened in the other media lately. We've had you know Venom in the movie, obviously. Um, we've had yeah, uh, we have very great for Venom the movie. You're into that one? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, great. For, I'm very into Venom the movie. It's like the perfect. Well, it's not perfect, but it capitalizes the '90s you know feel right of his miniseries and one great movie. And it's, and it's introduced, you know, the concept of Venom as an antihero to far more people, and it introduced, and people have actually gone back into the comics, like, uh, I think her name was Ellie? Uh-huh. The screen girl? The, the who? Uh, the screen, uh, wo- the woman who liked Scream when, uh, you brought her on as a guest? Oh, yeah, uh, Allie, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was fun and great, you know, kind of cathartic to hear her story. Yeah, it was really cool to hear someone who got into Venom through the movie. I mean, I for me, that's that's the coolest thing to hear because you know that's that that means the movie did its job. It brought her to the comics, and then now she's found a character that she connects to in the comics, the way we and you connect to Eddie and stuff. So, yeah, no, and you put that comment in the video, and I was so happy to see that. Like, yeah. Hearing that was great, and I hope to you know interview more people like that because I thought that's always a good perspective to know that our character and a and a, and a semi you know pretty faithful version of him adaptation that went to the masses. It's good to know that it was done that well that it would bring people back to us in the comic world, right? Right. Um, and so we've had the movie. I know you like the movie, and I, and I agree with you. I think the movie does its job very, very well, um, and, and and captures Eddie in a lot of good ways that r- reminisce of the comics. But then we have other things like um, you know the Spider-Man video game where they're setting up you know the fact that it's it's not Eddie that might be in the suit. We, of course, we don't fully know what's going to happen until the game comes out, but that's what it looks like is that you know Harry Osborn might be Venom. We've had the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon that had um, you know other people be Venom uh, before, and there's no Eddie actually in that cartoon. Five seasons, there was no Eddie. We have the current cartoon that had an Eddie uh, for a couple episodes, and he was Venom, and he was a reporter, you know, and th- or a journalist. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking about that. I was like, you know, when I was interviewing the writers of that show, I was like, that's the first time we've seen Eddie as a news reporter of any kind, whether he worked at the Bugle or the Globe or whatever, but he's in the Bugle in that cartoon. That's the first time we've seen that interpretation of Eddie since the 90s cartoon, in cartoons. Especially, uh, well, they get it wrong with it's a photo. He's an actual journalist, you know, instead of a photographer. Sure, sure, sure. But I actually, to give them credit, I did uh, think their Eddie was pretty, you know, on par with 80s Eddie. Though I'm more of a fan of the Ultimate Spider Cart Man, sorry, Ultimate Spider Man cartoon, okay. because uh, what they did with Flash. Yeah, Yo, okay. You like the, you like their version of, of Flash on that show? Yeah, because uh, why they did try to merge Eddie's and Harry's characters for some odd reason. Uh-huh. Um, Flash, actually, they use Flash to not only do Agent Venom, but actually pull from the different 90s, you know, storylines. If we had, like, more of an hour, you know, two hours or something, I could point out all the little references in the one storyline that introduced, introduced the symbiote you know, Hostless uh, version of Carnage. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. Actually, oh, go so ahead. I like when they go really faithful with it. Well, you know, referencing the comic a lot more than. And Flash uh, became kind of a hybrid of Eddie as well in that. Yeah, I have to. So I have to admit, I haven't seen Ultimate Spider Man yet. I was doing a cartoon marathon trying to catch up to Maximum Venom. And of course, I just didn't have time to watch five seasons of a of a cartoon. So now that we're dipping back into the um, the Flash Thompson comics next month on my, on the on the show, I'll probably 
go and and watch on Disney Plus. I'll watch all those uh, those episodes of of you know Ultimate Spider Man. So that way I can talk about the cartoon version as well as the comic version because I have heard that I've heard heard people say they liked those Flash stories and they like where they took the character. And I'm I'm intrigued to see it. I you know it it sounds neat. And yes, you're right. It is from the same writers who are writing the current cartoon. And that was one thing we talked about a lot on that on that episode where we interviewed them was they were saying like, oh, you know, we've done versions of these characters before, so to do different versions is hard because we got to do different what we did before. But then also there's that, of course, there's that easy like, oh, let's just do what the comics did because people will love that and, and that'll be, you know, you know, that'll be the thing that gets a lot of favor and gets people to like our show. But then the downside is like, well, then we're just repeating what great people already did and we're and we're not doing anything original and we're just copying off their homework essentially. And so that you know, there's that need to like try new things and um, and then there's other business reasons why too. I mean, like people forget sometimes when you make a cartoon, it you're getting notes from everywhere. You're getting notes from, you know, Disney probably, Marvel at their home office, you know, like you as writers in the room, like they and then you, there's there's a lot of things that happen in cartoons. So it's a tough medium to, to go through. So with that, like, you know, the cartoons are kind of their thing and I know I know we all have our opinions on those. The games are one thing. But I like your definitive venom. Obviously I agree with you. Like I, I love that version of Eddie and you know and I think as long as the movies stick with that, I think the the masses uh, because that that movie made so much money, that which meant so many people saw it. So as long as that many people go see the second one, and Eddie's the you know in the same ballpark, it will you know will that make you you know continue to be happy with people's v- version of Venom? Because I think he'll become the definitive version, right? Yeah, it, I would be happy with it because for so long it's just been eighties Eddie, you know, over and over and over again. Sure, they, like they say do something new but the Eddie's Redemption you know in other media doesn't really happen at all the 90s series uh, kind of did it but killed it off you know in, at the end of the arc you right. know, killed Eddie and cleaned us off basically right yeah it's true I mean yeah he got redemption but at the cost of his own life and um, yeah it's true but, but that's also because I think they went really villainous with Eddie in those first few episodes and that was, yeah. and that is, and sometimes that is the case. It's like you you make someone go too far, and you're like, well, the only way to redeem them is to kill them, doing an act of kindness. And it, it does happen. It's a trope, you know. It happens all the time. But um, yeah. But you know, I'm curious. So like, one thing I do like though is like, like I said, normally when I click on to YouTube, like I, I check it maybe twice, two or three times a day at the most to see what comments are there, um, because like I said, sometimes I get notifications, sometimes I don't, and you know, I'll see a lot of people just go like, hey, man, great episode, or, you know, they do that, and, and I love those. I lo- that means that they're watching and they're commenting, and that helps the algorithm, that helps the show get recommended more, and that's always a positive for me. But I do feel sometimes a lack of, like, resistance. And so I know sometimes I get that from you, and I like that. So don't so please don't ever stop doing that. Um, because what I, I like <laughs> cause what I like is that you're honest, and then you also are fair. You go like, hey, Seek, you know what? I agree with this point. But I'm I'm not so sure about this point, so you know I'm I just want to know and and like I said I'm glad for this I want to know why or what what made you get to a point where you were comfortable to open up to me like that because I, very few people do and it it does mean a lot to me actually. Well, uh, from my experience on YouTube, YouTubers you know they don't usually talk with their commenters at all. Right. We kind of get ignored for the most part, even at and that best get one of the heart, you know, emblems. Mm-hmm. Right. And you in particular, not only did you talk to me, you actually took me seriously, you know. Sure, of course. So I uh, really appreciated that respect. And since we're both, you know, big fans of Venom, I felt I could, you know, we could have an actual discussion. Because usually when I'm talking with people, in the comic set uh, section of YouTube, who aren't YouTubers, they think that Venom should be R-rated. Right. That he's just one big, you know, monster. Right. And I will point out storylines and recommend, you know, books that they can read. But they just go, "No, uh, Venom is this," and basically ignore me. 
Well, that's frustrating to hear, um, but I also know exactly how you feel because that's uh, what happened, you know, happens to me even still now um, on YouTube. I comment on other people's stuff a lot. I try to be active in the comic book community and watch their videos and uh, and kind of spread that around, you know, and, and kind of increase my awareness and, and then also like hopefully people's awareness of me. And you're right. There is a lot of times where you leave a comment on a video that maybe has like 50 views and it has like five comments and the person doesn't engage back, you know, the, the YouTuber. And, uh, and it is frustrating. Or if they do engage back, it could be negative because they disagree with you. And that's, that is around the time when I decided to do Venom Vlog because I was like, you know what, I don't, on the shows I was doing before Venom Vlog, I wasn't really looking for people's opinions. Every time I would make a video, I'm just like, oh, here's my opinion. And I never really th thought, well, there are people watching this who want to get involved. I should hear what their opinions are. And I was so glad, like uh, one of the first times you commented, like you did, you were like, because I, I say it on my videos, I go, hey, if you have a different opinion, let me know down in the comments below. And I think sometimes people are still, even when they hear me say that, don't want to for some reason because they're like, yeah, I either like the video or I, or I didn't like it enough to give you my opinion or, you know, people are kind of on the fence. So it was so nice to see you come in and be like, hey, actually, I have a different view of Eddie and, and this is my view or actually that story meant this to me um, and I got this from that story. And I, I love that. So I one, I hope you keep doing that to every channel uh, that you that you watch. And I definitely hope you keep doing it to to the Venom Vlog channel because I love seeing your comments, man. I, I don't want you to ever think that you're crossing a line with me. And I'm sure you don't feel like that way, right? Right. Thank you, Psych. I'm yeah. very grateful that RNS introduced us, even though sadly he no longer is a Venom YouTuber. Yeah. Is oh, so that's how you you came across me. I was just about to ask that yeah. actually. Okay. Um. Yeah, I'm bummed about that too. I, I saw him post something the other day that he doesn't use that channel anymore and he just live streams video games. But um, my hope is that I can you know, reach out to him and get him on this uh, show and at least talk to him one more time to get him to talk Venom again. But I'm afraid to ask him now because he seems very adamant about not doing the stuff he used to do and, yeah. and, and kind of going in the new direction. And so I'm, I'm, I've been hesitant to ask him because uh, – but I, I, the reason I want him on the show is because he was nice enough to have me on his. And now that I have this platform, I'd like to talk to him about the character uh, because he's always been great. And I, I love his stuff. And you're right. I'm, there's a part of me that's bummed he doesn't make it anymore. But I also understand that he, it's important to him that he doesn't as well. And his lack of presence uh, is missed because you and him were like the only two YouTubers brave enough to question Donnie. You know, on things, yeah, like actually give them criticism. Yeah, it's 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 funny. I I never, I never understood like when I wrote comics. I and I didn't write that many, but when I did, um, people would come to me and they would they would just tell me, "Oh, it's great. It was a great issue," and I hated that. I actually really didn't like. I'm glad that they liked it, but I was like, "There's had to be something in it you didn't like. Please tell me because I want to make it better. I want to do better next time." Like for me, it's all about evolution. I like evolving my art or my creations. Um, I like I don't like being just like, oh, I do it one way, and that's that. I'd like to improve, and uh, and so I just assume other people are like that. So it's it always astounds me when I critique someone, and then they don't like me because they're like, "Hey, you're critiquing me." Donnie's not like that. Surprisingly, Donnie reached out to us recently, as you saw, and uh, and he yeah. does he does actually want to come on the show, and that really <laughs> sorry. Uh, if you're hearing this, Donnie, I'm actually a big fan. Oh, yeah. Uh, although I do have my criticisms, I'm very grateful that you not Dark Origin, sorry, Psych, oh, Seek, sorry, uh, Seek, <laughs> yeah, that's right. uh, Al Continuity. Yeah, yeah, uh, no. <laughs> I know you're happy about that. <laughs> uh, if we can get on Dark Origin, well, sure. Uh, sure. I wanna, mind it as badly if it wasn't for that one scene where Eddie abandons Anne. Sure. Yeah, that's a... It, it seems a little out of character. You're right. Uh, but I know I, we had this discussion and I understand why you like Dark Origin because Eddie is a very flawed character at the end of the day no matter which origin you go with. Sure. Yeah. Uh... Yeah. It's just uh, there's little moments that kind of, uh, you know, peppered in that kind of make me tilt my head. Like, how did you get this? But uh, I 
think in the end of the day it was just to make Eddie more like his Ultimate and Spider-Man 3 counterpart. Sure, I get that. Um, I get that and I understand that because... But that's also the reason why I like Dark Origin is because it does... It does... The flaws in there that they put in Eddie are... are some of them are a little more vicious and they make, make him a little more villainous. But I think of, well, in Amazing Spider-Man 300... He was very villainous. So to write yeah, him, he was. yeah. So to write him that way with those kind of backgrounds, because that's where the book ends. It leads right up to the final, you know, the battle in issue three hundred of Amazing Spider-Man. It's like retells that story, and it's like all the origin leading up to that. So the reason why I don't mind how far Zeb Wells pushed the envelope in that one, as far as Eddie being villainous, is because it made sense. Because obviously. In Amazing Spider-Man 300, Venom was very much a villain. Now, if you were to retell his origin now, I'm like you. I would I would probably straddle that fence a little bit more and have equally good things with Eddie and equally bad things. Whereas in Dark Origin, it's more negative. So I, I totally agree where you come from. But but I what well, that's what I liked is that you you list, you heard me out, even though you have a distaste for that story. You did hear me out, and we had a great conversation about it in the comments. And that's what I I love about it, man. Is like is that you were like, all right, cool, that you have your reasons why you like it, I have my reasons why I don't, and we're both still friends and fans of Venom at the end of the day. Yep. Honestly, the only thing I would change for your sake, you know, I wouldn't change much. Uh-huh. I would just make the origin, you know, faithful to the details we saw in Lethal Protector. Sure. Like Carl and Rich. Yes, right, yes, that's right, he had money. Um, and, you know, and I know people, like, uh, you know, it's it's weird because I know like Venom's sister didn't have a massive role in anything. She was like she appeared in one other comic outside of Venom, and then she appeared um, in the Dark Origin storyline. And so to really, I rec- think there was also one more appearance. You might be but right. You just remembering. Yeah, you might. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. You might be right. There might have been two or three appearances of her. But so I know that's not enough to where I should be upset over, um, you know, a retconning of her. But at the same time, like someone who's grown up in a, in a similar household, I guess I'm projecting a little bit, which a lot of us do when we, we connect to something. But the idea that um, he had someone like a sister kind of torment him uh, anytime he tried to do the right thing, uh, I think helps that understand the broken compass that is Eddie Brock sometimes. And Yeah, actually, would a cat, you know, marry as a... Thing. I was shocked when Donnie made her non-existent because while uh, Dark Origin, you know, didn't follow Lethal Protector, she still was a thing. And even though Le- she wasn't in Lethal Protector, sure. she had a good, you know, run. In the co- well, not a good run, but you know, she was mentioned. She kept on mentioned at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. I remember. I think uh, she was mentioned uh, in the one storyline in the 2000s where it was revealed that Eddie had cancer. Yes. Yeah, she might have been, actually. And, I thought, and I, like you, I thought she actually added a little bit more than she took away from the origin. That's that's my thing with characters. Is like, um, I, I, When I was getting into comics, every time I would pitch something, I would uh, honestly get feedback from editors that go, you know what? We're not a fan of this because, um, you know, you, we can tell you're trying to tell this story, but uh, but you feel it feels like you're hindered by the continuity. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not hindered by it. I'm trying to use the continuity that exists to help propel this story. And I go, but if you have notes on how to change, you know, if you want me to change some of that, and I think, uh, or they would go, or I'd have editors sometimes go, hey, why are you doing this? And I go, oh, that actually happened in X Men number fifty four or something, where Bishop did this, and they were like. Uh, oh, okay. Well, you don't have to reference that if you don't want, if you want to tell a story. And I'm like, well, no, I know, but I but I am referencing it because it helps the story. So it's funny sometimes that you, you know, to be fair to Donnie, like for all I know, he's pitching stories and talking about stories and maybe he's referencing things that editors don't know about or, or no, you know, or, de- or it gets lost in like, all right, it was in the planning to do it and add the character of Mary. And then maybe at the last minute yeah. they decided not to. So I'm always fair to people. And I, and that's why I'm excited to talk to Donnie uh, on the show about that because uh, maybe I can ask him questions like that. But, uh, but I do too. I'm like you, I, I don't dislike the guy. I love that he has catapulted Venom to be one of the premier uh, comics at Marvel right now. Um, that's a, that's amazing, and the book is selling really well. And it it is a lot of people that saw the Venom movie that are coming to the comics, or even old fans that haven't read Venom in years are coming back. 
and it's like a beacon. It's like a it's a lighthouse for fans, and I applaud him for that. I think that's amazing that he's doing that. It's especially notable for me because unlike uh, other writers, he actually kept A's hero progression so far. Like A's still trying to be, you know, go full hero and like in Mike's run. Right. So that's been notable to me. Why I kind of give Donnie a little more of a break. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, he's it's it's not it's not an easy road to become a hero or be heroic, and that's not just. Just because Eddie has saved New York City as anti-venom and everything, it doesn't mean there's still not a struggle to keep doing the right thing. Because that's that's what's so great about Eddie is that he is this guy who always wants to do the right thing. So you can always show that struggle with him. And you're right, Donnie's doing a, a really good job at that. I think there was a quote from a character in Skyrim called Parflamax. He said, "What is it? What is better, to be born good?" or to become good through your own action. And that always stuck with me. And I think it really applies to Eddie. I think that's a great quote. I've I, Everyone raves about Skyrim. I never played it, but that is an um, amazing line. And you're right. It does fit Eddie so well. Like, you, you know, and I actually agree. I don't know if I want to be born good. I think I'd rather discover that going through life, through the obstacles that life presents us. And, uh, and I think by earning it, makes you even really more good and heroic than someone who's just given it, right? Right. Um, I think that's part of the reason why I like uh, any better than Peter. I kind of agree that Peter can be a menace at times. Yeah. Because uh, one thing I noticed about Spider-Man is it, not with just with Eddie, but with other characters, he'll hold grudges. Yeah. For the longest time, too even when it's to his detriment. Yeah, I agree. It, it to a fault. You're right. Um, yeah, he, he, Peter, Peter's the epitome of someone who can't let go of the past because the past is where Uncle Ben died and where Gwen died, and those events always shape his his present and his future. And to so, the point where yeah. he would give up his own wife and daughter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, think about that. Like, yeah, the, he was... He was uh, I, I mean, granted, we can obviously blame that on Joe Casada and, and the people who are really involved, but you've got to also acknowledge that that is part of Peter's history now and that he did make that decision, whether you agree with it or not or because creators made, yeah. him, made him or not, he did make that decision. So you're, you're right, and, and that, shows, that shows Peter's you know, lack of ability to really move on. I mean, he couldn't let Aunt May go, and like you said, that led right to probably one of the biggest mistakes of his life is letting go of he could have actually had a happiness with Mary Jane and a child yeah it's a it's a bummer um but that's why we like these characters too is uh, they they sometimes are a reflection of us in a way or they're a, a way to see abilities that we would either like to have or attributes that we w- don't want anymore in ourselves and that's why I think Eddie is such a great conduit for that is anyone out there who feels lost I feel like Eddie is a great character to kind of make part of your life during that period when you feel lost because he's had a lot of victories and they've been really great heartbreaking victories and some have been small victories um, but I think Donnie's probably setting him up to have one of the biggest victories that that character's probably ever had in comics. I agree and it's especially notable to me because he made him a single father and... yeah. This is Father's Day, and the thing is, in our you know current culture, fathers, single fathers especially, are kind of disregarded. It's true. It's very true. I, I um I had a friend in California before I moved out here to Florida. He was a single dad, and uh, he was uh, he has four boys, and I my mom's a single mom with two boys, and I know it was hard for her for just the two of us. So I can't imagine a single dad with four boys. So I remember when I left L.A., I had, like, these four bins full of toys. And I was like, look, man, I am i can't bring these with me. I don't have enough room in the U-Haul. And I go, but I set them aside so you can give them to your boys. And I go, because I don't know how hard it is for you to, you know, buy them toys all the time. You know, I imagine it's tough with four kids uh, by yourself. So I said, just take all these bins and just give them each a bin for themselves. And, uh, and yeah, you're right. I feel like sometimes, like, I grew up without a dad, but I do appreciate 
good dads when I see them. And you're right, single dads sometimes are kind of the unsung heroes out there. So uh, I'm glad Eddie's in that in that realm now too. And now there are other people, dads now, can relate to Eddie for different reasons. And I think that's great. Like you said, the character, he's not on a hamster wheel anymore. He he fell off yeah. and, and he's, uh, he's, he's car- carving his own path. I just wish Dylan was a normal boy instead of... <laughs> <laughs> whatever he is <laughs> me and you both I, I wish that too I, I just saw a piece of preview art today from Venom number 26 and it shows Eddie as Venom swinging through the city and Dylan's hanging on to him and Dylan has this facial expression of like looking scared and I'm like nah I, if, he would be scared if he was a normal boy but he's like some kind of demigod so why is he looking scared right now uh, well to be fair to Donnie and Dylan uh, he has the mind of a normal boy, at true. least. That's very true. You're right about that. Um, and you know what? Maybe after all this is done, he can be depowered and turned into a normal boy, like Pinocchio style, and then, you know, Eddie Brock can have a real son. And then we can finally have a, the sleeper combo, the sons of Eddie and Venom finally <laughs> there you go. united. You know how they did the super sons of DC? They can do the symbiote sons. Um and that would be great. They, <laughs> they could have stories with uh, with Dylan and Sleeper. That'd be amazing. Two brothers. Um, and then, thanks to Nick, he was really turned around because he was horrible beforehand. But I guess Spider-Man is more of his alley. He's setting up, you know, undo one more day. So if we, Eddie, uh, if they bring back Peter's and Mary Jane's marriage and then daughter, you could have uh, kind of an MC2, better MC2 thing going on hey that'd be great I, i'm i love spider girl stories so that would be really cool um that's awesome man i so i gotta say because we're, we're getting near the end here so i want to say first and foremost um you know thank you and i do appreciate you uh being a viewer of my channel it means so much to me actually i love the comments you make i um you know i love your passion for stuff and i'm glad that i felt the need to do the show the way I do so that I can meet you like this and then eventually have you on the show like you have no idea like people are like oh you're you're you know you're being too kind to me like a couple someone a couple episodes ago and I'm like no talking to all of you guys is like my is like I don't react to celebrities the way a lot of people do but I react to people like the way other people react to celebrities so to have you guys on this show to me improves the show but it, it improves me too as a content creator and that's why i'm glad i'm doing this and and uh i'd love to know like you know later after we talk we can talk afterwards for a few minutes who other people you see in the comments that you'd like to hear on this show because uh and everyone who's listening to this comment down below who else you'd like to see on the show because i'm, I'm nearing the end of my list now of who i asked on the show and probably in like a month or so, I'm going to start recording these again and uh, and try to get more people on. So um, so we can talk about that after uh, Swordsman. But is there any last words that you do want to say before before we wrap up this episode? Yeah. Uh, Seek, I'm very, very grateful that you decided to be my friend and that we can discuss Venom and all this. And uh, to anyone that, you know, this is the channel... Uh, I really like that. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be, you know, more of a fan of Eddie as a villain or more of a Flash fan, even though uh, we haven't really gotten into Flash. Huh. You're that... all welcome here. You don't have to, you know, worry or anything. We are Venom. Yeah, well said, man. We are Venom. And that's the thing is once that line was said at Brazil Comic Con when the whole audience was chanting it, and I put that in my intro. I said, that's my mantra. We are Venom. From now on, we are all in this together. Anyone who comes here who's a fan of Venom, whether they're a new fan, an old fan, a fan of Flash, a fan of Matt Gargan for some reason, a fan of Eddie, like whatever it is, you're welcome here. And uh, and I eventually, you know, you comment, you help grow this channel like Swordsman did, Eddie's Mullet, Ali, Lonely Symbiote. All these people comment on my videos, which helps grow the channel, which helps get it noticed more by people, then that's what I want. I want to, you know, have you on this show for helping me grow. And Swordsman, you've helped me grow a lot as a person and as a content creator. So thank you very much. Yeah. And thanks for being my friend too, man. And everyone out there, uh, make sure you uh, check out Swordsman. He's in our comment section all the time. So if you ever want to start strike a, a conversation with him, please do it there. And Swordsman, I appreciate your time today. Thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. 
it was nice talking to you. You too, man. Everyone out there, if, if you're liking the show, comment down below what you thought of it, and we'll continue our conversation down there as always. And uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and we'll see you in the future. Peace.